Yeah, it's tough. And so the first major shout out for sponsorship, the Mike Duo, Campanovo and Myers. Hey, we would not be here if not for them. And Myers just ran back to get his phone because he left it at home. We were trying to avoid him going to Maryville again and he had to go back this morning because he forgot his cell phone. Because uh, he's bringing the food from, where are we getting food from? Chase McDelly. Thank yes. you. Because I didn't know. I, know I had no know. idea. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we bankered around several things. So yeah, they, they funded our life coming up here to give us a room. Second year row, and uh, good deal. And I saw Mr. Zaraka sneak in. Hey. Cumberland Urissa guilty party. I already, I already yelled your name out, or Cumberland Urissa, or the co mingling, or whatever was going to happen. So you can, you can make a Cumberland Urissa pitch if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah! But we will, uh, so anyway, that's one of the, that's. So that's two sponsors. Sort of two. I guess y'all are. Mike, Mike, Mike does the, Myers does the county extension. Mm -hmm. And your job is to proselytize the masses. The GIS outreach coordinator. The GIS outreach coordinator. He has a sand, he plays in sand. You didn't bring your sandbox. Oh, oh, he should have because he showed up source. Yeah. Oh, man. I'll show you a picture in some videos. Okay. <laughs> we'll, bring, we'll, we'll set it up next time. It won't be the same. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm tweeting, I'm trying to tweet madly uh, to explain what we're doing and, and give OSGO US some, some uh, love in the matter because. So, here we go. And after this, we'll take a break. I may run over a little bit. But like I said, we got, we got plenty of buffer space for questions and. You know, impromptu performances, so if you want to do the mapillary thing, we can even we can even go that route. You can get up and like scream something about mapillary for five minutes. Alright. We'll we'll be easy. So so and because we got longer, I'll tell you more about my involvement with QGIS, which some of you guys have probably heard about. I'm just gonna like oh, he's gonna talk about that story again. But I will. because uh, we got time. So, who am I? I'm the guy that's been annoying me with emails, bothering you about stuff. Um, I own a consulting firm. How awesome is consulting? It's different. <laughs> it's actually been pretty good. I was still, still, we were walking out, and I'm like, man, I'm so glad I have to deal with the art space anymore. Because as of right now, like 99% of my work is open source. I've got one volunteer crew I work with, and they're using art. They got the grant, the nonprofit grant license, and I'm begging them to switch off from it. It's 100 bucks a year. Man, I just, I'm, I'm pushing to get them off from it. So I've been working 10 years, and 12, 12 part time, 10 full time. Uh, two, so two years I was new like. Uh, I worked at TBA for a good while. And, uh, yeah, 90% of my life is now free and open source. People call me in and I will gleefully try to move you off art. And we get there. We'll make it, we'll make it happen. Because it actually blends really well right now. As of 3 2, which we'll talk about, you can really run an instant environment and get away with it. Which up until now, it's always been, yeah, you can sort of do it. And I always had some hesitancy because there was a little bit of weirdness when we were jumping back and forth. but. That's really kind of gone with the three series now. Um, so, QGIS it started as a data viewer. The data viewer for PostGIS, and we'll, we got one other two PostGIS talks sort of coming out, talking a little bit about that. Um, this guy Gary Sherman, who lives up in Alaska, wrote it, and uh, you know, there's no good way to view PostGIS. It's PostGIS is. Is an extension to the PostgreSQL database. And if you've never used PostGIS, I think it'll change your life. It's one of those things that's just kind of a little weird gal because you can do all your SQL scripts and check your data and do all kinds of cool things. Um, and I'm not that great at SQL, but I'm getting better. Um, I started using it in 1.8, so I got sent to the Virgin Islands to work. And the people sending me were like, Hey, we're going to use all the like, as I'm crawling on the plane. I'm like, hey, we're going to do everything in open source. And I went, what? 
and all the plane went. And so when I landed five hours later, uh, I started exploring like what, what, am I, what are they going to send me? And they were sending me post GIS databases. They, they worked all heavy command line. And I need to see stuff. So I, I downloaded OpenJump. OpenJump people. Oh yeah. You need to, everybody needs to experience OpenJump. That was the software that uh, if you need a manual, then you don't need to use it crowd for a good while. And they've actually got a manual out now. Um, so I started using 1.8 in 2013. 1.8 was rough. 2013, five years ago, and one it was rough around the corners. Um, it was not easy to use, but it was exciting enough that I was able, you know, I was able to produce data, could transfer stuff back and forth, I could make shape files, and keep working. And it was pretty cool. And then two came out, version two came out, I want to say later that year, or early 2014, and that changed everything. Um, they changed Python versions, they changed the interface. The interface got more professional looking. Uh, it didn't have these clunky icons. They actually tried to make the interface, the, the, the interface uniform. Um, and then around 2016, uh, the QT windowing manager, so this thing that makes QGIS, QGIS was getting long in the two. That was, that was two years ago. And the, the developers, which you can talk to, them, they're actually really cool. We're saying we got we got to fix this. We got to upgrade. And uh, so last year's meeting a year ago, I tried running QGIS 3.0, and all it did was crash. It was it was a terrible, what a good presentation. And uh, I could not get it run. So I think I was over in like 10 minutes. Um, it's, it just wouldn't work. And a year later, they released 3.0, and it was pretty nice actually. Uh, they did a lot of stuff. October of 2018. Will bring the long term release of 3.4. So, three times a year they release new software in QGIS world, which is kind of a headache uh, if you're running a lab. Um, uh, speak to a professor at Alondo, Lexus Alondo at Ohio State, and she's running QGIS on all of her labs. And it's tough for her to stay up to date. I mean, she's running a bit behind on everything. And, uh, you know, three times a year they release. I would like to you if you, you know, stay up to date, download the new uh, patches. So, 2.18 is current. I think it's 2.18.17. They released 17 new, new bug fixes. I think it's 21 now. 21. It's, it's, I've stopped running 2.18. So, I don't even know what it's up to. But yeah, it's, it's, and 2.18 is currently stable. That's the one. They, they release it. It doesn't change. They fix the bugs. They don't add any new functionality unless something is really is itching for them to add. And it, it works really well. And then 3 came out. 3.2 came out. 3.4 is coming. And I'm running 3.2, so I'm going to show you 3.2 on here. And hopefully it will crash because it's not going to be fun unless this crashes in the middle of it. So when 3 was coming out, so they already got 64-bit status. That wasn't an issue anymore. That wasn't an issue. That hasn't been an issue for quite a while. Um, they went 64 bit a while back. And they got the framework, which some of you may go, uh, I don't care. The QC5 framework is up to date. The good thing about that, mobile, really, that's kind of the big itchy. And, and to fix some of the clunkiness, I think, between Mac and the PCs, the high DPI, the high DPI screens, uh, they're trying to take care of that with 3.2. Uh, I noticed on some Surface tablets, with Mr. Kinder, man, some of that stuff was, I thought like I was going blind looking at it, but they've done a lot of work in my API. Um, they start really working on processing and trying to get the processing framework. You, those of you who are users, uh, actually, what do they call it now? Art. <laughs> the, the toolbox art processing? Art, art what? Art. Yeah. They, they're working on that, trying to use that running. Two years of development, two years of screaming if you watch the developers list go on. And in December of 2017, there was some arguing going on. Do we, when do we release this? They missed like two or three release dates already because they didn't feel like it was good enough. And, and you know, what are the users expecting? What do we need to do? And somebody finally put their foot down and said, February, it's a go. And February creeped up and it released. And it was good. It, it really wasn't that bad. Um, three two came out. Three two just came out a month ish ago. 
and they crammed everything they had missed in three to the three two. And we'll, I'll show you some of the stuff they, they did. Um, what this really means, the three series will be stable for a while. Uh, what happened this time? They had to break the Python plugins again. So it went from Python 2 to Python 3. So those of you in the Python world, like I, I can sort of write a Python script. You hold the gun to my head, sort of. But I still want to write a plugin. I think it's found a reason to. So I'm working on that. Um, the PyQGIS, which is the RPy kind of duplicate, they're, they're revamping the documentation. They're, they're documenting the plugin. The, um, the processing, uh, making the documentation look really nice. ARC has really good documentation. You know, I love the help. You get in there, you can find what you're looking for. Uh, they got a grant to, re to revamp the documentation for processing. I think that's spilling into the pipe, PGIS. Um, so here come the big changes in three. So for those of you stuck in ARC land, we dealt with this with Emory County last week. Geo package. Have any of you guys heard of GeoPackage? You need to learn about it. It is the thing I've been waiting on. I can make GeoPackage in ARC. I can hand it off. I mean, I can make it in ARC. I can hand it to QGIS. I can make one to QGIS. I can hand it off to ARC. It blends well with everything. Uh, there is no more the excuse we need a file-based geodatabase for deliverable. You may get that still. But you can do it with package. Um, it goes back and forth. It is a standard thing now that's happening. And who just uses it? Uh, who only uses it? Doug, you? Uh, just about everywhere. It's the default export for vector and grass. Yeah. Oh, it is now? Yeah. It uh, says yeah. is 7, I don't know if that was, I think it was 7.4 that came in. Yeah. Like that. And hopefully this kills all shape files. I know everybody loves their shape files. <laughs> I love the shape file, but really, you can kind of get rid of your shape files out because you've got that package that will now move between everything. Yeah. Do you know the compatibility with uh, like AutoCAD, CAD-based softwares? Because that's yeah. the reason like we're using like shape files and stuff. Because uh, yeah. CAD is AutoCAD jumped in. Don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah. We should yell at them about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can't, I mean, we, I'll start tweeting out again, it's like, hey, come on, let's work. But yeah, so this is the big thing, and we did a, we did a, a data delivery for 911 last week, uh, back with the 911 state system geo package. Um, we think it'll be accepted, it should be accepted. Uh, everybody's using geo package. So what this spun out of, we've been at war for a long time. I mean, we've been, we've been, the military has been active now for 17 years. That's a long, a long time uh, to get shape files, CAD data, um, image, various image formats, um, spreadsheets, Excel. How many times Excel changed in the last 17 years? You know, so this standardizes your package delivery. And uh, the GeoPDF, the Terrago people that make the commercial uh, package, they've been internally building GeoPackaging now for a couple of years. That goes to the military. So this was really a push by the military to say, get on board, we need one package delivery. And at Fox 4G St. Louis, this was, everybody was talking about GeoPackage. Like the last couple of years, it's really weird that much, and suddenly everything's got to be GeoPackage. And if you look at, you just, so Vaughn is a, so I was saying QGIS after the last place they did, um, they did uh, development, and if I add some data in, Assuming I can find some data. Um, so let's add John's. Yeah, so if you notice the QGIS, notice the little cylinder sitting here, the GP, GPKG extension, that is the geo package. So I'm going to add that. Um, oops. Drop that into QGIS, and so it just adds in. I can then edit it and do whatever I need to do at this point. Um, I can hand this off to art if art people need it. Uh, there may be some whining. That's okay. Just deal with it. Deal with it and go on. Um, I think in 10.6, 10.6 is completely compatible. 10.5, I think, is 
nine half percent compatible. I don't know. Ten four. <coughs> I'm not sure on that one. But if you start getting geo packages, don't weird out. Be happy if you're getting them. Um, like I said, that's kind of my big thing right now. Just going, hey, this is it's a thing. Uh, you export straight out of the geo package that's the default for your team. Still make shape files. You still do all your stuff. If you need to make the QGIS, but let it go to the uh, geo package. 218, oddly enough, won't play well with geo package. There's a bug, and uh, the bug is was such a killer they couldn't fix it in 218. But uh, and the other thing is too. Also, you can uh, save your symbolization. So if you set up your symbol set in QGIS and you save the geo package, you can force that symbol set. I don't think it works with SVGs though, but you can, you can force that colorization into the geo package and then if I email it to Mike, he just drops it into QGIS and it's, it's symbolized already. So you can pass around your symbolization, um, which I think is pretty awesome. And it works on the PostGIS server too. Yeah, and you can also save your symbolization to PostGIS so you get that one, you know, you can, you can save it. Once again, I don't think it works with SVGs, but you can shove the color, you know, however you set up your symbol set. In there. Um, every file geo databases. That's not a problem anymore. Uh, before, did do some hoop jumping. You still have to do a little bit. You had to go here, select directory, open file geo database, select the vector thing. We're going to talk about the browser, but what happens now? QGIS will actually recognize a file based geo database from Henry County. That's currently the one that I have. And I can open it up and take a look at it. And it's going to show me tables with no geometry and tables with geometry. So it's pretty seamless. Now, writing it back to a file based geo database, if you're on a Windows machine, I am not. You can do it. You can actually build a file based geo database. And if you were on the QGIS users list last week, there was a hefty discussion. Uh, should we enable that? Should we enable all users to be able to write a file based geo database? And kind of the argument ended with, we've got geo package, what's the point? We, we've got that thing that they want, you know, that we can push back and forth. So I don't think they're going to, but you can very easily open it and look at your data. So if I just want to look at address points at the canvas, Oops. And from here, if you wanted to dump this out, you would explore the state feature as GeoPackage. And GeoPackage, you can follow me and a layer. And uh, you can just keep adding layers to that GeoPackage and keep building it out. Um, just be careful. It will ask you, you know, don't want to delete this, it'll, it'll pop up a little warning, so you don't want to delete, you just want to add a new layer to it. But, for sure you will. Yep. You might want to talk about that package layers for me, because that thing works great, it saved me a lot. Oh time. yeah. So what Ed, Ed's telling me, there's a command up here to jump back to GeoPackage again. If you have a lot of data in your QGIS file, uh, your, your QGIS you know, piece of software, you're sitting there working with it, and three, I believe three, well, three, two, I believe three, uh, you can dump everything that you have in there into one geo package using this package layers command. So you just pull everything in, hit package layers, and it shoves it all into a geo package for you. Um, it'll save you some time. I, on the other hand, sometimes click one by one and just go, yeah, save, yeah, save. But, you shove everything in at once. Uh, and with automation, with Python part, you can probably set the script to do this um, within QGIS to, to, to even more automate this. More, and that's pretty automated. Um, so yeah, that was one of the, so like I said, three things are changing. Projections, everybody, projections are changing. They're an honest and goodness thing. Um, so there's this huge heartache in 
to a valve projection? Do you, do you project on the fly or do you develop? And ARC automatically projects on the fly. And there was some discussion they decided, and I kind of don't like this, it's already been to one client, um, set QJAS to project on the fly for everything. So if I pop this open and I go down to the bottom right hand corner, uh, you'll notice that the projection dialog has changed a little bit, but you can't turn it off. No projection. Uh, I had a guy that was working in Kansas, and we were reprojecting. He had drone imagery, and he had uh, nave imagery, and he had state imagery. He was trying to reproject it to Kansas South something. And so we would do the reprojection, and it would all stack. It all stacked up perfectly, and he thought that was the worst thing in the world. Should stack up and change the projections. Well, it's going to because it's projecting on the fly. Turn this off. And so I sent him a QGIS file with that turned off and it, it slung his data everywhere. So the UTM went in this direction, NAT83 went in this direction, uh, WGS84 went in this direction, and Kansas South sitting right yeah. in sort of the middle. So uh, just be aware of that. They're also rewriting Proj 4 and Proj 5. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, they don't know what they're going to do with the website because the website is proj4.org and they don't want to change it. So that's been the, what do you do um, at that point? But that's one of the things. Uh, the other kicker is, and this has bitten me a little bit, Esri projections. So Esri has their own flavor of projections. You have the EPSG codes, which QGIS consumes. And I think anything above 100,000 in QGIS land or, or 10,000. Uh, I, I think it's a hundred thousand. I'm not it's, sure. Yeah. So sometimes you'll add some data in, and you will see QGIS do this crazy thing where it gives you a generated CRS. Um, and what I have found in three, two, still, it still chokes a little bit with Esri projections. So if you're working in Tennessee State Plain, that's 2274 EPSG code. But some of your Esri software, you move data over, will have it as 102. 678, I think. Uh, let's see. 12736, uh, which are compatible. I mean, 2274, I believe this are pretty much identical. Uh, you also have this nice little window there, like kind of gives you an idea of where, where does your projection actually go to in the world. Um, that was something new that they added. Uh, and it allows to go back to picture on data transformation. Uh, have never done that. Maybe I'll have a chance. But, so, like I said, all the stuff that is changing in three, the data source manager, this is the one I didn't really like. I'm kind of warming up to it. So, ARC has that one button. You hit that one button and you add all your data and you're done. QGIS has nine buttons. Kind of like the nine buttons. Vector, raster, you know, post GIS, all your stuff was laid out. And they really wanted to kind of tap into the the uh, art people and you know show that there's a viable thing. So they made one button. Now the one button points you to nine other buttons now are actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen buttons, because they've added more stuff, but one button now. So when you pop open QGIS 3.2, uh, you'll see this toolbar floating around. And you open Data Manager, you get all of your settings, you can make a new geo package, you can make a new shape file if you really want to do it, uh, make a new spatial light layer, and a new temporary scratch. Temporary scratch is only in memory. So you can do some processing and mess with things and tear things up and go, bam, done, and delete it. And it doesn't soak up more, uh, more space. Uh, so it's pretty slick. Um, the hey, other thing. Randy, I just wanted to mention, yeah. it's actually faster if you've got a lot of different directory trees to just have your Windows Explorer open and drag it and drop it in if you look at yeah, Windows. Yeah, you can drag and drop. Yeah. It, work, it works really well. The other, the other kicker, the other thing, so in 2.18, those of you who used 2.18, remember you install QGIS, and you get that QGIS browser. That thing is sort of like our catalog, but didn't really work very well. 
<laughs> you always got it, you're willing to go around. Like, well, why is this installed? That was a one-off product that somebody had paid QGIS to write. And they wrote it, and it hung around the entire two series. And at three, they were like, we're done, we're rid of it. But what they did, they poured all the effort into making this browser, which is built in, in several spots. And like Doug was saying, you can't open Windows Explorer to drag and drop to your heart's content. I've actually found myself using this, uh, the, the browser to do all of my work. And uh, what I'll do is set this up and go as a favorite. And it shortcuts up here. So I can go in here and very quickly start dropping data. Uh, and uh, I want to drop that in. Uh, I want to drop this in. And I think all that's showing up somewhere. I know that's coming in. But the browser window, actually, I'm using it more than I'm using anything else at this point. Uh, it works a little bit of everything. You can, you can have shortcuts in it. Uh, they've really kind of idiot-proofed the browser. Because before, they had that whole built-in add-on. Uh, they just didn't really work right. And now, it works. Like I said, you can see your file-based geodatabases. You can see everything. You can see your other QGIS projects. It's working really well. And you have access to everything here. Um, RGS map server and feature server. So if you've got somebody running an RGS server in your in your shop, uh, did I save? I didn't save it. I've got one set up for the state imagery that's running off the uh, art server, so I can pull it in for the Tennessee state stuff. So, but I didn't reset it. When I rebuilt my workstation a couple weeks ago, I don't have, I don't have everything back normal. Processing. So they poured a lot of effort into getting this processing toolbox up to snuff uh, and making it like you would expect. And they had a lot of tools. They rewrote a lot of tools. Uh, before, they had a couple of things. They had some stuff up in the vector menu that maybe didn't come down here. They had some other things. This is all changed now. And so you can see you've got a lot more tools to work with. Uh, built into here, recently used, uh, contouring, symmetrical difference, all this other stuff. You can go through here, you can search through it, very easy to deal with. It does run in the background now. So if you kick off a geoprocessing task that's pretty hefty, it's not going to bog down. You just you have to sit there and wait. So kick it off, let it run, you get a little status bar running down here in the, in the corner. Kick off several, just keep stacking the status bars up, you can watch it scroll back and forth. Reselect. It's it's nice. Um, really standard looking feel. Even to the point they've got URLs. So if you have something sitting on a internet a website somewhere, you can actually program it to go out and grab stuff and pull it down for you. And all the stuff is put together through Modeler. Hey, that works now. Um, and that Modeler over opening a bit. So. It is working really well. Oh, and also, the other thing they did. So in the middle of the free development, after free was released, they got kind of irritated, the developers did, and uh, Orfeo, Sega, all this stuff, and they were having a hard time because the developers were, were going to grass and were going to the Orfeo people and going, hey, help us. We need to get this straight now. Just hand me what you've got and we're going to shove it into QGIS. And there was a tremendous amount of heartburn down here. The stuff was breaking. And at the last developers meeting, February, March, they made the command decision to stop including that stuff. And they said, you know, we really want to, we want the Sega people to work with us, but we're going to put the onus of making this work on them. And Sega went, okay, we'll, we'll get standard, we'll get everything. And they, it drags behind. I think Sega is up to, you know what version's currently out? This is like the two series still. Four or less than higher. Yeah, this is still like in two, three, or two, six, or somewhere further back. But it's getting there. Grass, grass is a, I mean, that's a major component to all this. And so grass is playing, they're, they're working, trying to get that all plugged up and fixed. So R, so there used to be a plugin for R, and you would go to processing 
options, which then moved, and I'll talk about this in a minute, to settings, processing. So your providers, Google Graph, Sega, R used to be a provider. Uh, R people are now talking about building an R provider uh, to plug R directly in. R was kind of clunky before, but now they're talking about direct integration in the future. So we'll see what we'll that. Uh, hopefully here in 3 4. Possibly. Maybe. Hopefully. Uh, they could use some money, so if you want to donate, <laughs> they they burned through some major funds trying to get three out the doors. So they're in a, a, a swing right now to try to generate some more money because they're it's a nonprofit. They just build software and keep going. So uh, I actually got a chance to donate this year. It was kind of nice. For all of the work, I mean, it's 90% of my life. I actually got to throw some money back out. Uh, the project files are now compressed. In 3.0, you get two files now and you build a QGIS file. You get .QGS and .QGB. .QGB holds settings and other things. And it's kind of weird because now you've got two files as opposed to one. So they've actually compressed all these together. Um, and so you get a .QGZ file, which makes it a little bit hard to open. I think double clicking on it, I think on Windows it probably works pretty well, on Linux not so much. So I just drag and drop everything. I don't double click anymore, try to open things. You can embed labeling. Uh, labeling now, what happens, you can actually move your labels individually. You don't like that labels, click on it and move it. And it stores the location in the UGB file. Uh, you can also embed layers. I haven't done that, but you can start shoving data into it and pretty much I'm guessing at this point we're great what they would have a map package. Is that the ARC lingo where you pack everything up in that one format that only ARC uses? Well, you're, you're getting there with that. Uh, embedding layers. For mobile. So I started playing with mobile. So I love Fulcrum. Fulcrum's like my commercial itch for mobile software. But QField is falling out into the mix. It only runs on Android, unfortunately. And of course you can't see it very well here, but um, you can load it on here, you can set up a project on your laptop, drop it on your phone, and go out in the field and start collecting data. It's not the super easiest thing in the world to do, but it's doable. And that's something pretty huge. And I want to say, um, not a smooth transition currently, could be wrong, actually I think I have wrong, because they have now set up a synchronization button. So you can synchronize all this data, I believe it's a geo package, dump it to your phone, go out and work with it, or tablet. And I loaded the downtown Chattanooga Nate imagery on my phone, walked around like a dork in downtown. Hey, check this out. I'm standing at the bridge. And uh, you can see everything. And it saves all your embedded widgets. So if you set up a widget drop-down list, it works here. Uh, in theory, you come back in, and your phone up here is synced, and it pulls all those changes back in. Haven't done that yet, so your mileage may vary. Your phone could melt, your computer could blow up. I don't think it will. So don't blame me if you go out and do this. The options that I want was completely redone. They, they build processing and options. Options is really, it it's, looks about the same, a little bit different. So here's the weird thing. Uh, and I'm at the end, so you guys are completely listening to it. So let me open. Let's see if I can do this. Data. Why our data? So my forestry client, who refuses to get step into the 20th, 21st century, uh, because you don't put lasers on a plane. Uh, he owns this piece of property, and so I pulled the state's LIDAR data and actually pull all the trees. He, he replanted pine, so this is his retirement plan. So he went out there and he replanted uh, one age of pine, another age of pine. He cut this over, so it's regrowing probably hardwood, and they did some cutting in here. He didn't get all the hardwood out, as you can tell. And if you look at, if you make it look prettier, Let's go with the red green. 
So you can see the field over here, this field's been cut, this stuff. You can't really tell. I had this brilliant idea, maybe I can see it in ages from here to here. This is the one thing I called you on, but like, how do I? I didn't get the skew, the skewness. I didn't get to that part, but uh, pulled all was playing around with it, showed him, he was like, man, dude, come on, this is really cool. And you jazz now. You 3D map here. They have 3D now. It's okay. <laughs> it's not, it ain't that great. This is a work in progress. But if I go in, change the elevation of the final, let's make the perfect scale, something crazy. Um, you can actually see some elevation in there. Not the smoothest thing in the world, I guess probably compared to some of the stuff they're doing in Pro, RGS Desktop Pro. Uh, this is very much a work in progress. So this guy, they, they, they had a plugin called QGIS to 3D, 3D JS or something like that. And there's expanding that work, including it into here and working in 3D. It will do 3D vector, it will do raster. Not the prettiest thing in the world. They're still working with it. And I think 3.4 is supposed to bring another pretty hefty uh, change to this. So, but not bad considering. Uh, you can see it's a little bit clunky. It tiles the data, so the data will change as you zoom in and out. This is all tree height, so there's a lot of doors and everything else in here. Uh, process with Google, actually. I took the uh, ZLAS, ZLAS data and uncompressed it and shoved it into here and actually processed it with that. I was able to pull out this information, so not a bad thing. Uh, yeah, 3D is here. The vector 3D, I, I talked to the developer. They don't suggest you stress it out too much. You could put a three-dimensional vector in there, like say you did New York City buildings or something like that. It would probably crash. Hopefully 3.4 is not going to, but it's another component uh, to this. The other thing, actually, Mr. Hayden <laughs> was, was asking me about the search bar. They actually have a search bar down here in the corner. Type of locate, and if you load vector data, you hit F, and then the attribute you're searching for, and it will search your your layers for you. So it's pretty decent. Maybe use a little bit more work, but you can actually activate some of your processing tools from down here in the corner. So if you're a keyboard, if you're loading the keyboard, just go down here and start hitting Control K, and then look through processing tools. Um, They'll go through project layouts, layers, you can change your active layer, you can search for attributes, you can do calculations on it. Um, you know, pretty, pretty slick uh, stuff that they're changing. And the whole thing, in this talk, I'm like, where do I think they're going? I don't really know where they're going <laughs> at this point. I wouldn't have this grand like announcement at the end, like this thing's going to float your laptop and wash your car and walk the dog and do all this other cool stuff, but to me, the big thing is, you can replace our jazz now, just about. And up till now, I've almost said you always have a replacement. I really think you have a replacement at this point with all the stuff that you put in there. And if you did replace it, you know, if you send 500 bucks a year, 400 or 100 or something like that, cool things will happen. But, um, and you're seeing a little bit everywhere now. I mean, you go to a meeting like this and say QGIS and people raise their hand, go to a tension meeting. I did a, a QGIS workshop in February. I don't know when the, when the conference was. It was at Montgomery Bell and went to that. And people were excited. Uh, the park ranger up there was just tickled silly because he can't get an ARP license through the state. He's like, he'll go log in and try to get an ARP license. He can't get one, but he can do his work now load this on a laptop or a desktop or your MacBook or whatever you got and go to town and start working. So it's pretty slick. I don't know what QGIS 4 is going to look like. I mean, they, they, they 4 is lightly bantered around. What are we going to do? I don't know what they're going to do. But it's, it's going to be pretty cool. Uh, 3 4 I'm excited about. Uh, join us at QGIS.us. So we're revamping 
the user group. In 2014, it was kicking along. It died. <laughs> Lost momentum. Uh, myself, Kurt Minke, and Michelle Tobias, who is a GIS librarian. It, have you talked to her? Have you, have you seen her on Twitter? Look her blue for um, she's a She's a librarian at Cal State. Um, but we've resurrected it, and so we want to have a meeting. I want to have a meeting. I want to do a meeting somewhere in the southeast this year and just get the QGIS users people together to talk about QGIS because we have a lot of art GIS meetings. Why not? That'd be pretty awesome. Everybody in the room, tell me, Shh, bring your work and talk about it. Maybe we can make an art one. Maybe we do a Chattanooga or Ford Library. I don't know. Um, join the users list. Email people. Uh, I had the greatest conversation with a guy out in California that was doing wildfire planning for his neighborhood. Uh, he had just downloaded QGIS because he didn't have access to ARC. And we walked through setting up his neighborhood, putting zones in, and all this other stuff. It's fun to do. Uh, Thought bug reports. The first few you do will be painful. After that, that should will listen to you. So you follow bug reports. And you get that 999 thing in ARC where it blows up. And you type out some you know heartfelt thing of I lost all my work, and then it disappears <laughs> into Cyberland. And you never hear anything else back from it. One time I did, I wrote something really ugly. Like I put in a bunch of nine letter words and four letter words, and they emailed me, told me don't do that again. <laughs> but you can really go through. Yeah. I, I filed a book once, and they fixed it in three days. Yeah. With, with Q yeah. I, my, my longest running bug report with QGIS, no kidding, there was a bug with people in the US using the state plane feed. So <laughs> when you would go to Europe, Never had a problem. Everybody's in meters and you know something else. And the area kept coming up wrong. And so there was me and like two or three other people like, hey, this is broken. I don't and you kept sending them data. And finally the, the Niall Dawson and some of the developers are going, okay, these guys are screaming enough there must be a problem. And there was a bug. There was a legitimate bug and they fixed it. Um, yeah, I got a couple now I need to file, but time <laughs> time to do it. But yeah, they'll fix stuff, we'll let you know. Uh, you can email them. Talk to them. Uh, just be nice. You know, it's a nice group of people. Much nicer than the open street member out. The open street members here. I'll say that first, and then I ask if I should say that. But yeah, the nice group of people. Uh, I enjoy this group more than I do any others. The post jazz people scare me because they're smart, and I don't want to. I don't want to email them like I don't understand why this doesn't work. I can do that here, and everybody's really, really kind of cool and collected. So we got. But users are popping up everywhere. So join the U.S. Um, go to the QGIS website, join the U.S. users list, and yeah, start talking. And that's about it. Questions, aims, fear. QGIS, yeah. Just a geopackage thing. I did see something on the the Google list about a guy who said, "Well, when I get up to five thousand packages, it seems to get a little slow." <laughs> and at five thousand layers. Yeah. And and he was immediately answered by one of the developers who said, "Oh yeah, we noticed that. We fixed that. It's in the next version." <laughs> yeah. So they've got a better indexing system. So you you can put a lot of layers in there. Yeah, and it, it works really well. I mean, it's just like I said, I've always wanted that package. You know, you, you you've always shoved stuff. The art people go there any day. They go there. Here's the shape file. And I'm sorry, description turned into scriptio, and you know, that's the best we can do. And, Here's a spatial light database, and they go, what spatial light? God, God, come on. <laughs> um, but the cool, and the other cool thing, this has nothing to do with geopacking or anything else, Google barn raising. So they're fixing the coordinate system stuff. For, I think it's for Proj 5, the re the, re yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, right now, Proj goes through uh, WGS 84, it does a two-step projection system. Yeah. Puts everything to WGS 84, and then off to whatever else you're doing. And with this new work, they based it on some um, uh, existing code from the Dutch military for their their projection system, and it's been all open source and integrated into the Proj 5.3. In fact, the guys do it are taking over the Proj 4 project, yeah. and it, it's uh, it is being revamped so that it can deal with the new uh, data changes that are coming in 2022. 
from uh, the National Geodetic Survey and just globally. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fascinating. So, like, if you ever wonder, like, how much people care about open source stuff, Esri paid thirty thousand dollars to help get this fixed. Esri paid thirty thousand dollars. They threw money at it. So here we need just we need this fixed as much as y'all need this fixed. And uh, yeah, they raised like how did they raise one hundred forty four thousand dollars to make this work. So people make people are taking note. You know, we're throwing down some of your money. Um, maybe a couple of five hundred dollars. Save software, the FME people donated 31. Esri put in 30. Um, Cardo put in 5,000. So people, you know, people paying attention to this open source stuff, which is really pretty cool that you've got commercial love going on from, from you know, you can get it from Ezra guys. Hey, no, get support. Do it. $144,000 worth of it. I mean, somebody cares. Enough to do it. So, um, Anyway, yeah, all the stuff geo package, all the stuff builds out to the software you're using. So, okay, who's going to be the next to pick up? Should I scream?